in the sequence of the parshias, the smichus of parshias, the juxtaposition of uh, how the parshas, uh, the different subject divisions in parshas Noso go. So there's first the, the parsha of Sota, then Nozir, then Birkus Kahanim, and then the Kobonus of the Nesim, the Sota, the woman who's a suspect of being an adulteress, the Nozir, somebody, a Nazarene, who takes on an obligation which is not the, the norm. He goes beyond to uh, not drink wine, wine products, grape products, uh, something he imposes on himself, an extra kind of a, uh, of a dimension of discipline, of, uh, of being uh, separated from, uh, from what normal people, average people indulge. Third Pasha is Birkas Kohanim, the blessing that the Kohanim or uh, it's a mitzvah for the Kohen to bless. Uh, according to, we have sources in uh, Rishenim, and it's brought uh, uh, later day, uh, latter day commentaries that the that it's a mitzvah for a Jew to be blessed, for him to uh, take the initiative to get blessed, be blessed by uh, by the Kohanim, and then the Kobonus and the Nesim. So Rashi already quotes a Chazal that the, somebody takes on being a Nazir, being a Nazarene, that he's abstaining from something which is really uh, acceptable and uh, mutal for him. Uh, when he sees the Sota, this woman who's been suspect of... Uh, behavior, which was unacceptable. She was warned not to be in a certain situation with certain person. And then, then uh, she didn't listen and she's suspect. We don't know that she's a, an adulteress, but there, there is suspicion. There's, uh, as I say, there's, there's circumstantial uh, kind of evidence to hold her suspect. And then there's a, uh, mystical process that's uh, described procedure that is described in the halacha of how to to explore how to to know what uh, what in fact uh, what in fact was the truth so if uh, if she is an adulteress the the procedure will uh, expose her to uh, this mystical procedure of taking certain kind of uh, waters from the from the floor of the the, the mishkan the base migdash uh, that the it it will it will create a uh, uh, a kind of spiritual potency that will expose her uh, her transgression and if she is not guilty, it'll turn into a blessing, but she has to go through a very unpleasant, awkward kind of a uh, stage, stages she has to go through in order to get there because in fact, she did create this suspicion and she's guilty of at least of that. So Rashi brings the Chazal that somebody takes on this degree of abstinence from wine, from, from drinking, from eating grape products, because the majority of such situations where a woman, where a, a woman found herself in such a situation, it comes from partying, from drinking, and he is going to now react to go to an extreme to make sure that uh, this will not, this threat will not enter his life and he'll be able to, to control himself. 
Reb Shimon says, Reb Shimon at Tzaddik says that the nausea is a kind of an ambivalent situation. On the one hand, it's um, something admirable about somebody wanting to protect himself. On the other hand, because there is certain, once he enters into that state of being a nausea, then he has certain restrictions, including um, extra stringency for exposing himself to halachic tumor as far as uh, retaining a, an extra degree of sanctity. And if the nausea, then after he accepted these norms and is now governed by these halachas with this extra stringency, and he fails, he makes some mistake, and he becomes Tommy. So he has to bring a korban, he has to bring a korban, he's a chayte, he's a chattas, he has to bring that the... Rabbi Shimon said he never ate from the from the Oshom of a of a nausea. Because who asked you to you're a chayte? You took on something which you were not capable, and you, you didn't have to be capable of maintaining that level of caution of not drinking the wine, of not eating from wine products, and not eating from grape products, then then you put yourself into that situation. Till one time, Rabbi Shimon says, that there was a young shepherd from the Darom that came up and he had this coven because he had, in fact, uh, stumbled after he uh, spiritually stumbled, halachically stumbled, and he became Tomei. So now he's bringing his Oshum. Rib Shimon had a position that he didn't drink with, take from that Corbin. But he asked this young man, how, how, how did this all come about? And the young man explained to him that he's a shepherd. He was out at the watering hole at the brook with his flock, and he saw his reflection. He was a very handsome, charming young fellow. And he said, I'm going to be confronted with Nisianus, challenges, tests, because of my, my looks. So I need, I need an extra precaution. Rav Shimon was so taken with the sincerity of this young man that he made an exception. And he, he took from that Corbin. So... There's a kind of a paradox here. There's a, there's a definite uh, ambivalence. On the one hand, it's admirable. On the other hand, that you're taking on something which might lead you to something which will cause you to, to, to make a mistake and to, that you're going to have to bring a carbon that you wouldn't have to bring under normal conditions but it has this, this state. So, then we have the Birkas Kahanim. So I would like to suggest a possible, possible understanding of the, of the sequence of Rashi already tells us that there is this uh, connection between Saita and Nausea but perhaps we carry it further and explore it in its in its initial symbolic dimensions as well. Saita we could read as this woman who has slipped and slid into a to being suspect of being an adulteress. Even if she's not, it's a, we would call it a forfeiting of the 
neshama in favor of bodily gratification. It's a, it's a slip to Bahamiyut, to a certain kind of animalism. Is man merely just a more complicated, sophisticated animal? Or is there a soul, a Tzalem Elohim, that is housed, is a tenant in this physical bodily existence? The behavior of the Saita indicates that she has minimized the, the neshama dimension. The, uh, the, the, the Bruvain finds a chetzalik lebrava roshiva in Tervedas was once medayik that uh, we say in Shema that uh, not to go but usually it should be the other way. Anechem should come first, your eyes should come first, and then the, uh, the eight Sahara is aroused, that the, the eyes are the silsil, the agent of, uh, of bringing the arousal to the heart, to the, to the eight Sahara. He said, how come it says, he says sometimes by the male, that's the way it works. Einechem the By the woman, it can work and often does work, says the that it's levavchem and then einechem. Is that she has a uh, an inner challenge of a desire to display, celebrate her femininity. To, to parade it, to go public on it, the diametric opposite of the tznias that Chazal and Taylor teach us is admirable. Uh, I may have mentioned in uh, one of these earlier shurim that uh, I was once in a taxi in New York and the uh, driver had on uh, the radios some program about the uh, some husband who made the uh, classic uh, mistake of uh, escorting his wife while she was on a so shopping binge and uh, he's uh, following her around in the in the ladies uh, clothing department and he's going a going a bit uh, a bit bonkers and he finally walks over to one of the clerks over there one of the women uh, clerks and he says to her a saleswoman and he said isn't there anything he's trying to find his way out to maybe he'll look at something uh, for, for men and he says to the saleswoman in the ladies clothing department excuse me isn't there anything here for men to which the saleswoman said, everything here is for men. That's what it's about. The Rosh Hashanah created us. So, and that the, 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 is the, is the giving supremacy to the neshama over, over the goof. So this, the nausea, we could say, since it is in fact ambivalent, is a an overreaction. Stay within the halacha. Use the guidelines of shmiras and ayam of being where you have to be, when you have to be there, and the the kedusha that that emanates from that in the norms of. Like Claudia says, the Kedusha, that the of Ohole Yaakov, that the that even our enemies had to own up to, is that the one Pesach was not opposite the other Pesach to reduce the chances of tripping spiritually. So, but so 
do it the halachic way. The halachic way. Not, Chazal say, you don't, you don't take a young man and dress him up in all his finery and put him at the, at the footsteps of a brothel. At the, because something he and they are doomed to, to trespass, to transgress. That we line up the genius of the Jew, the halachic Jew, is line up probabilities in your favor so that you can be selective in where and how. We'll follow this now. So the nausea, in a sense, not comparable to the, to the breach of a saita, but it is a breach, in a sense, because you didn't have to position yourself that you would be exposed to have to be a chayta to bring an extra korban, to make that mistake, to fail that way. So it's an overreaction, but it's a, an overreaction that's obviously less, but it's a, it's a mistake in a, in, a, in a very real sense. That's what Rabbi Shimon was teaching us. Then comes Birkus Kohanim. Birkus Kohanim is the first bocha. Rashi brings the Chazal, Yivrecha Shem Yishmerecha, is on our material wealth, our material being. Yo Shem Ponevelecha Vivonecha is the spiritual, the ore, the light of Torah. Yisro Shem Ponevelecha Vivonecha Vivonecha Sholem is merging the two with the ideal balance. It's the balance that is then achieved between knowing how the shmira on the brocha, on the increase in material, knowing how to utilize. The Jew is not an ascetic. The Jew doesn't, doesn't champion asceticism, but he champions selectivity consciously deciding where and how to interesting that in the English language to shelter, protect, guard uh, something and to hold it for the future for, for a proper uh, utilization is called to husband the wealth. Not accidental in providential guidance that, that the sneers for us is to be selective, to husband the, the gift of that femininity in its context, in its ideal context. And Yiso Shem Ponovelech Yosem Sholem Shlemus. Shlemus is the achieving of wholeness, completeness in a comprehensive fashion. The chinuch, the rishon, the chinuch, the brings on the mitzvah of baltashchis, that the tzaddik finds it intolerable to waste anything in, in the world. Even the seed, a mustard seed, he doesn't want to waste. Everything is potentially redeemable, it's a resource, it's an instrument that can be used. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu is up on high and the malochim, the angels, uh, present a, uh, a challenge to giving Torah to man that belongs in Shemayim. So the Rebbe Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you answer them. Moshe Rabbeinu catalogs the difficulties, the problematics and complexities of being a human being with all of the halachot that have to govern us, whether it's in mercantile or in spiritual kind of events, situations, 
in that the complexity of navigating between body and soul is, is a human affair. Malachim are exempt from that. And that's what the Torah is about. And that's why Odom, man, is called man. Odom, from the Adoma, from the earthliness, is that he can sanctify it. And for whatever reasons, the Rebani Shlanim, the creator of the universe and man, wanted this kind of an elevation, taking the merely material and to raise it to to extricate the sparks of sanctity that are there since the fall of Odom Marishan, again by Shvira Saluchas, that they that there are, it could have been in a more ideal way, but it wound up in this way that we have to have to now redeem it. And finally then, finally then, once you get to the point that you have achieved this balance, this exquisitely delicate halachic norm of getting to that point, reaching that climax, then you can take it's the korbonus of the nasim, the sacrifices of the princes of the tribes. You can take a real animal, a genuine animal that is soulless, and take that animal and utilize it for Kedusha. You can take the the completely animalistic, but that's only after you've achieved, internalized this kind of a balance. Especially true in the world in which we live, that we just experienced, re-experienced the moments, revisiting the moments at Sinai. They they saw the sounds. There's a stunning mabit in the Beis Kim that says if you look at the lettering on the, the words, the way we have the breakdown, there were different shitas, different uh, positions on it, but the way has, that has passed down, the first five are between man and God, the second five between man and man, the second five in descending order, the way they appear in every book, Beit Knesset and every yeshiva is man man. The man man portion, there are much less words. And because there are less words, says the Beis Elohim, those that lettering had to be much larger. I assume that what he means is that the words carved into the stone of the tablets. They miraculously held the tablets, not the tablets contained the carving, but they held it. That's why when the Isis left, they flew off, as related by the Medush, then the then that's when the, the fell, the throwing of Moshe Ben became too heavy. But Moshe Ben elects to do that as the as the situation governs it. says the Mabit that comes out that the lettering of the Ben Odom Le Chabero Man Man Mitzvahs had to be much larger to cover the same space because they held up the tablets is implied in what he says. And that would be in order to emphasize, says the Beis Elohim, to emphasize that the weak underbelly of Claudius on history would be, would be the man man mitzvahs. And that's where we're at today. We're at, a, at an urgency to revisit the man man mitzvahs. And in fact, there's no question that our community is exemplary, as we've said so many times the free loan societies, every not just money without interest, but every conceivable 
item that anybody might need at a given moment. There's a gemach for it, and there are thousands of gemachim in literally hundreds and hundreds of cities around the, the Torah world. And the, the major hospitals, the major free food societies, mind-boggling the chesed. Somebody standing from a distance, he didn't hear the sounds of Torah. Rehima Sakuras, he sees the sounds. What does that mean? In our generation, especially in our generation, where the what was once unacceptable on the beach has now become uh, prevalent on the streets. And so there's a challenge that how to use one's eyes. And the Rebani Shlalem then built in to Torah, the eternity of Torah, that every generation would have its linkage. And somebody now, his father didn't learn Torah or Davin, but he was at Sinai, his neshama, and therefore it's built into his neshama, he can see the sounds. He can see from a distance all this chesed, all this kindness. Will he see breaches? and problems and scars and warts in our community, yeah, but no community compares, can compete with the extraordinary commitment. It's a terrorist chesed to begin with and a terrorist chesed to And the Shmir Esenayim, the, it's not accidental that the oral law, Rameya Simcha, emphasizes that Moshe Rabbeinu adds a day of his own volition, utilizing the principles of the oral law at the moment of receiving the Torah, designating which day should be Shavuos. And it's accepted. The Rebbe Hashem accepts it. Says of Meir Simcha, it had to be that way so that there would be an immediately a coupling of the oral law and the written law that they would build in the month of Sivan is the month of the constellation of the twins because there's a twinning of Teresh Bixab and Teresh Balper. And there will come a time where there's going to be a need. Klajaso takes different decisions. The authority, the Paiskim of Klajaso, the sages, and Rebbe decides to write down Tere Shabal Peh. He writes it down in such a manner and a fashion that it remains a Tere Shabal Peh. Right? Try and read it casually. Osamech is on the street of Shimon Atzadik, not accidentally. And there's a narrow kind of a street Pasha Street goes to a dead end, mostly parking there, uh, named after William Albright, who was the archaeologist at uh, Hopkins. When I was at Hopkins, he had just, uh, I believe, retired, though I did meet him when he came down to Neyesol uh, at, at another point. He was very helpful in uh, recognizing the, the, the extraordinary uh, genius of uh, the learning of Torah, the Talmud. He was once in a library at Hopkins and he came over to one of the Bacham from the yeshiva that was there in the library and he said, I've translated every word on the page. I can tell you the etymology of all the, the Aramaic uh, roots but and conjugate them. But I can't for the life of me figure out what the Gemara is talking about. Not accidental. His problem was built into the situation that even though it's written down, it remains an oral law. But why did possibly one of the reasons it had to be written down is that we could read with our eyes the oral law so that we could attain to a level of Kedusha when we're so challenged and threatened in the Western society, in the post-Aquarius world that that keeps challenging us more and more. Yes, this Kedusha.
especially these days, the, the sense, I think we have to all look at it that the Haftorah we're going, we're reading, Manoach says, after such a heavenly, miraculous exposure, we're not going to be able to live. And his wife says to him, if the Rebbeinu Shalom didn't want us to live, he wouldn't have taken our worship. Our learning, we have no, as we've said earlier, we have no explanations for what's happened, the COVID, Maron, Kalin, Arabs, rioting, missiles. Some of the things we can identify, mistakes that should have been handled better, differently. We have constantly an obligation of hakol satoiv, of gratitude to those who are putting their life on the line to, to protect us. Of course, that doesn't mean that we shut the Gemara and go out and pick up a gun. What it does mean is that if somebody is doing that, the Shaloha Kodesh says, Yivarecho Hashem Yishmarecho, the Birkas Kahanim is in Loshan Yochid, that each Yochid has to have his particular bracha for his Avaida, for what he has to do. But all of us should be, have to be, davening, learning with a sense of Kedusha. And as long as we can go into the Beit Knesset, as long as we can open up a Daf Gemara, it means the Rebbeinu Shalom is accepting our Avayda. And if the Rebbeinu Shalom is accepting our Avayda on some level, otherwise we couldn't be doing it. The Rebbeinu Shalom is encouraging us that, yes, paradoxically, as ever in Jewish history, much pain, much suffering, and much recognition that we have been positioned in a place by Hashgocha, by Providence, to learn more, do more, and none of this can be experienced without a sense of Gilu Berina, rejoicing within the trembling that we have been given the privilege that if I'm here now, all of us, there's a hundred and zwanzig, it means that the Rebbeinu Shalom wants this Avaida, this learning, your learning, my learning, our learning, our davening, and to embrace as many of Achenu B'nai Yisrael that weren't close enough to hear the father didn't learn, didn't daven, but some level of their neshama they are as a kailas. They can see even from a distance. You can see further from further away than you can hear. You have to be close to hear. You can see when you're, I can see you down the block. I can't hear what you're saying. And you can also see hearing has to be sequential. You have to know the say that the generations understand who is an Ovi? Who is a Tana? Who is an Amera? Who is a Gain? Who is a Rishon? Who is an Achon? It's crucial to understanding what Klad Yisrael is. Seeing you can see panoramically. And if you're a Reyem that has been embedded and imbued in every Jew, we should be Zeicher to the simcha that comes from Shlemus, from that Birkos Kohanim that will give us the 
power, the discipline, the joy to fuse the ideal merger between body and neshama in a way that it will be quote Shemayim in Kiddush Hashem. Chazak ve'amatz, Yeshua's to all of Claudia's